Hello everybody. Today I'm going to be reviewing a script called HDRI Control, which is by Ken1171 Designs. Uh, this script adds HDRI images to Poser and um, addresses one of Poser's greatest weaknesses, which is that its lighting is crap. Uh, Poser did actually address this to a certain extent with uh, version 13 which enabled HDRI backgrounds uh, but this script makes it an awful lot easier. So uh, what is a HDRI? Well HDRI stands for High Dynamic Range Image and the range is the the uh, number of shades between the, the lightest point and the darkest point. Uh, a traditional 24-bit image has uh, a, a range of uh, 255 shades in each of the R, G, and B um, channels. And uh, that gives you a total of 16 million possible colors. And uh, HDRI image, 32-bit HDRI image, has a range of 4.3 billion. And um, how they're created is by taking a photograph of the same uh, the same scene with a range of exposure settings and then stacking those together to create a single image a hdr image or sometimes an exr image and stacking those together to create a single image which has a much wider dynamic range which enables you to to use those images both as backgrounds and as lighting so that's what this program is enabling you to do, which in theory will then create more realistic images. So if I just render this scene, you'll see there's the existing lighting. Now, uh, to install uh, the, the uh, what's it called, um, HDRI control, to install HDRI control, we just go down to the file menu, install from zip archive, and then choose the file that you purchase from um, from Poser software or from Bondware store, Renderosity. And then it will give you a script. In my case, I've installed it to the Poser 6 runtime, but you could have installed it to Poser 13 runtime or any runtime that you prefer. Then there's a Ken1171 subfolder, and then down here is HDRI control. And I click on that. And it brings up this now at the moment this doesn't dock if i wanted it to dock i could just click it on there and then as i move over various parts of the image such as here it'll automatically dock and um, when i go to different rooms it will be docked there as well in fact it's docked there even if that's not set i prefer floating uh, palettes so i'm going to have that there so here's the program so the first thing you need to do is tell it what folder your HDRIs are in. So I've got a whole bunch here. So I could choose um, here, Desert Dawn, and I just click on that, do select folder. And then when I click on this, it then gives me a list, uh, sorry, on this one, it then gives me a list of all the files in that in that folder. So let me just choose the very first one. You can see HDRI images. And when I now click render, uh, let me just check here. Okay, when I click render, hopefully. We now get the the uh, HDRI image underneath. So why is that not casting shadows? Well, by default, a HDRI image, you might think of it as a background image, but it's uh, it's purely a light source. It doesn't. It doesn't have actual substance onto which you can project. But when you first load Poser, you'll see that this object here called ground is visible and it gives us this background object. And if I go into HDRI image, control, sorry, I'm going to keep getting that wrong, and click Setup Shadow Catcher, what that now does is turns this ground into a shadow catcher, which means that when it renders, it goes invisible, except to provide shadows for any objects on it. So if I click render here, 
in theory I should now get some shadows and they're very very subtle uh, cast by the if you can see here let me just go back a little bit cast by the light source in the image uh, basically what this HDRI does is uses every point of light in this image it's a sphere essentially all around the scene and each pixel is casting light into the scene but where the light is brighter at the back here somewhere I'm assuming judging by that shadow um see the shadows are kind of coming over here so there's a obviously a light source over here let me just go and look at the original image so um if i go into desert one you'll see this light source slightly over here so it's going to be casting into the scene over here if the midpoint is here so what we can do is we can rotate that if we want so let's just rotate it in y and we'll do just a little bit to move those shadows around render that and the shadows that were here should now move around as will the rest of the scene and the shadows are very very subtle um when i spoke to ken about his program i asked why so uh, this program this script basically is a more up-to-date version of um, uh, the the Easy Dome script that Snarly Gribbly wrote that everybody loved so much and in some ways it's much better in many ways it's much better in some ways not so good so with uh, Easy Dome there used to be a button with, that you could press called Sun and what it would do it, it would figure out the bright point that had been that was in the image which had been defined as the sun or it could just be a spotlight in the room or an overhead light or whatever and it would then create a white light in that position an infinite light in that position and it would shine in to create proper shadows the thing is that easy dome created a dome around the image in fact it created two an inside and an outside one that created the background ground image that we can see here and one that created the lighting and the lighting part of the image was what's known as emissive so what it basically did was it, it used the ambient um, part of the material room and it turned the light into an emissive light and then it, it basically shone an image into the scene now ken says that they were jpegs ken is wrong because uh, easy dome uses hdri sibl format images so it had the same benefits as this program in terms of hdri but when you have a dome around the scene it uh, occludes or obscures uh, the infinite lights coming in from outside or even very distant spots or whatever um, and Ken also says that it also um, it also affects um, a number of other things let me just look up what he said it affects I think he said uh, specular light is is um, incorrect and uh, da, da, da. Uh, it, he said it uh, I'll, I'll read what he said it said emissive domes were the old way of doing things and had various problems such as light blocking damaging SSS that subsurface scattering and specularity they also generate a ton of noise making renders take longer um, I don't know if that's true but um, uh, you know uh, I, I, I certainly noticed that they occluded the infinite lights whereas this new way doesn't use a sky dome there's no there's no object here so if i if i go to um here we've got the construct here which is the default if i make that invisible you'll see that there's no uh sky dome image that has been added by hdri control it basically is a is a background image now i think if i go to the material room you'll probably see it if i do um background let me just have a look background okay that's 
yeah there we go so it set up this background noise um here and it's it's this this kind of background um environment and uh so this doesn't affect other light in the scene in terms of occluding it or or um negatively affecting it so it's a superior way of doing it uh according to ken and i, I think he's i think he's right on that one um he did say that he actually wanted to do it for poser 12 but there's a new feature in poser 13 apparently the version of python that is used in poser 12 didn't enable you to directly address uh hgri backgrounds and it's only in poser 13 that enables you to do that so anyway that being the case um is it better yes it is but but it certainly comes with problems so let me just show you here so this is uh this is my main camera again let me go back to my main m for main and here's the render that i get with that so this is really you know it's quite useful there's no lights in here except the hdri but what what he's done is set up this really cool thing so by by default these scene lights are actually shining in which is strange i would expect them to be casting some shadows which i guess they are if i click this button it now disables those scene lights which can make the hdri look too bright and now when I render, this is the scene without lights, just using the HDRI. But the, the clever thing that he's done is enabled so that when I'm editing, the scene lights are working. But when I'm not, when I'm rendering, these scene lights become disabled. Uh, I really like that feature. It's basically like the headlamp feature in Daz Studio. It just makes uh, your working environment a lot better. Now, there's another option here. If I select a light, such as this one, which... Um, I think that's light number one. Oh no, let's choose light number one because that's an infinite light. So it's quite possible that you might want your own light uh, to create stronger shadows. So this option at the moment, disable scene lights, disables every light in the scene. But if I now click this option, this now enables a selected light to remain on. Now this should have been enable current light, not disable current light. Um, and in fact, there ought to be an option here where you can en enable lights by name because it's quite possible that you might, might want two or three or four or ten lights turned on, but most of the scene lights turned off. Um, but supposing you are using a fill light on the faces, you are using a drama light at the back, a rim light or something like that, and then you are using maybe uh, lights over here to represent fog or something coming in from the side. It's quite possible that you might want multiple lights turned on, but the majority of the scene lights turned off. So disable current light. It's a bit like a double negative. No, I don't want the current light enabled, disabled kind of thing. It's it's a weird way of doing it. As I say, what you should have had here is a drop down list of lights and then you just select the ones that you want turned on. Nevertheless, I do love this disabled scene lights, but leave the lights on for navigation feature. Um, also, we have this HDRI cast light. To be honest, um, I I kind of don't much see the point of this because you wouldn't be using it if you didn't want a hdri but i guess the only possible reason would be if i if i turn that like that and render it should render to black okay it's rendered to black but the uh the hdri is still showing as ambient so it's still showing as a background um so um I guess the reason might be that I want to test my scene lights to make sure that they're contributing to the scene how I expected. Okay, I've got this uh, number of sample. There you go. So I might want my scene lights to, to show, but not my HDRI. Anyway, I'm going to go there, going to disable these, so I'm seeing exactly what, <coughs> excuse me, what I expect. Now, this option here is a nice little option, camera focal. Uh, according to Ken, the standard focal length for a, a camera on a hdri is 35 but uh it's set by default to 75 so if i click this this now changes to 35 and i need to zoom in and reframe now i get that but what i would 
I wish it didn't do. Here, remove HDRI. Supposing I suddenly decide I don't want that HDRI in the scene, so I click that. And then what it does is it removes that reframing. But I might want that reframing there, so that should be an option anyway. But um, So let me just go back to here. So we've got the desert here. Now, this option here, set HDRI, enables us to set whatever the currently selected object is, a uh, HDRI image. And if I just choose a different one, in theory, this option, where is it, where is it, load HDRI when selected, should have also loaded that new image but what you'll see i'll just set that back to um camera focal what you'll see is that it probably hasn't done oh my goodness it probably hasn't done that sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't oh i should have uh, okay no my mistake um it seems to me that sometimes it loads the new image sometimes it doesn't if it doesn't load the new image okay let's load an image from a different set uh let's go to Okay, so here it remembers my my directories that I've been to. Let's just try um, Radiant Skies and choose Radiant Skies 1, see if that automatically does it. So it's already selected. Let's render that. Incidentally, this picker thing here, the file loader, I... There you go. It didn't pick up the Radiant Skies. It kept the previous one. So now what I need to do is set HDRI so it doesn't automatically pick it up when you go to a new a new directory. But um, I would have found this much, much more useful if it showed previews. Um, the problem with HDRI is if I go here, here's a HDRI directory and it doesn't show up automatically in Windows File Explorer. It's, it's not recognized as um, as an image type. And I would have found that much more useful if it automatically showed a preview. Now, Ken says that's because uh, Poser, Poser and Python scripting is not capable of showing um, previews, which, I, you know, I'll accept it's a pain in the ass. That's something that Bondware needs to pull its finger out on and fix because that's um, a bit of a nuisance. So um, I talked earlier on about um, changing the 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 position of the HDRI, but um let me uh let me just render this one more time so i've now set this hdri i render that oh silly me still on a high high resolution there you go so now it's a sky background it's not a very good one it's rather rather dull so um perhaps if i move my point of view out more so um what do i need to do here i need to change my focal length and here's something weird if i click on exposure i can change that to manually to 0.1.1 or whatever let's increase that exposure to two because that looks a little bit dull and look what happens when i press return it tries to shut the document it does that in every single uh text dialog box um here's something else weird now I'm in I'm in the focal length and I press back shift to try and delete that. Can't manually type in. If I move the cursor up and down, it does spin through quickly. Or if I use these spinners here, but you can't manually type as you can in this, so that's also another bug. So I press enter, it tries to shut, escape, and now let's render that. Incidentally, I can use that or the poser render button or control R. I'll do control R instead. And uh, you'll see now that the uh, the focal length is much further out. So let's um, let's try moving that into say 20. There you go. Oh, that was uh, accurately lucky. Um, right. And now I just uh, change my camera position again. And there you go. Now I'm going to go back to an earlier image that we had. Um, only because it's easier to see um, on um, Desert Dawn. Oh no, actually, let's do um, let's do Ditch River. So Ditch River is um one of the original SIBL image formats that came with um, uh, what was the program called? Um, Easy Dome. And you can see here it's a 2K HDR. So um, when uh, when Ken says that 
uh, SIBL didn't support HDRs, he's mistaken. So uh, let's set HDR render. That reset the camera focal length here to 35. Okay, so I'm in too close now, I'll just adjust that, render that again. Okay, so supposing this is not the part of this image that I want to see. Well, I can rotate this very easily. Let's go 45 degrees round. But here, the lack of a live preview really shows itself. Um, this is a poser issue, according to Ken, um, because the program doesn't support HDR previews. Um, Bondware desperately needs to get on that. And you can rotate in X, Y, and Z. Now, I want to show you when uh, you can run into real problems. Uh, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, this image. Oops, not this image. This image absolutely sucks now this is going to highlight a problem with hdris there are a lot of uh, homemade hdris out there but um this program could handle them a lot better so you see there you can't see anything it's a room but the camera's just way too close so let's move the camera back to oops to five ish okay then we'll leave it there right let's render that see what we get Okay, that's too close. Let's say, um, oh, it selected it this time. No, it hasn't. Okay, uh, let's move that to 15. Maybe that will be a better position. Why is that zoomed in there? Right, render that. So this is the problem with this HDRI. The camera position is up in the air rather than down on the ground where it actually needs to be. And this highlights one of the weaknesses in possibly, well, it depends how you want to consider it, but HDRI control enables you to rotate your position, but it doesn't enable you to change it in X, Y, and Z. Uh, I could move these figures, but everything in Poser is based on the ground plane being where their feet are, including the shadow casters. So if I um, want these to be down on the ground now, I'm just going to take that back down to 10 then that's going to throw out everything else in the scene. So be careful what HDRIs you use. And also um, HDRI control could kind of help you to compensate for this. Um, speaking of compensation, as I said, it also does uh, exposure compensation. It also does white balance. So this scene, supposing this scene was um, quite uh, quite green. Oh, uh, well, quite blue. Very often, if you're... If you, create a HDRI that's in a sports centre, they have what's known as sodium lighting. And sodium lighting casts a green or a blue hue. And if you didn't have your white balance set on your camera so that uh, white is compensated to make uh, to look white, what you'll have is this green or blue hue. And so what you do is you look at your colour wheel and you take the opposite colour on the colour on the colour wheel. So if it's shining green or green or blue, what you want is orange or yellow and or orange or red and what you do is you'd select this choose the amount you want and then go here and then when you render now it'll put a slight orange cast on everything which will neutralize the blue obviously in this case this was uh, you know the, the color was uh, was okay um it would be nice if there was a color picker here that you could choose a white color in the scene and then it neutralized that. But again, because you don't have the preview, and again, that's down to Bondware, that's not down to Ken, um, you can't you can't see a preview in the scene to pick from, and that just sucks, that's Bondware. Sometimes I, I really think that Bondware is a, is a minimum effort publisher. Uh, they want the, the credit of having a program to rival DAS, but they really don't want to invest any money or time into it so um what else is there to think about um uh let's just quickly go through right so it uses what's known as um rectilinear or spherical maps and that's these kind of maps which is a kind of a uh, a 360 degree sphere flattened out into a into um a rectangle there was one more thing so so 
as I said before, uh, right, let me just go back to my um, my desert scene. So it would be nice, incidentally, if I had the option to remove folders. I think I might have said that. Let's choose Desert Dawn, Desert 1, set HDRI so it loads it. Uh, it's gone back to 35 focal length, which is annoying, kind of. It should stay wherever it was. Uh, but let's um, just move back out. In this particular case, it's appropriate. So I said that HDRIs are... Uh, can be used for backgrounds, as in this case, or they can be used just as lighting. So this is obviously providing lighting as well. But what happens if you have a scene where you don't want to see the background? So here's a here's one that I created earlier. So what I'm going to do is make a scene visible now. This is Urban School by uh, Sprawl, sorry, by somebody, um, Stonemason maybe. So this is a set we're looking at here. It's quite a busy set. And um, I have that desert dawn that the ground in that set is now not visible. And if I now render that, see this is a nice bright scene before. Almost all of the light is lost by the buildings occluding the light. And um, on one hand, I guess that's kind of right. Uh, it, with um, uh, ambient light, I think it would bounce around a lot more in the scene, so they wouldn't be so bright. So one solution here is to ramp the exposure up, let's say, to, I don't know, four, um, and it's trying to shut down again. And now when I render that, we'll get something better. Now, I don't know if this is still accurate as the other, as the um, scene was without other elements. Um, okay, so maybe we'll even have to go to five on the expo six, let's say. That's quite a big ramp up here. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to me that having other objects in the scene should cut out all of the light that reach these. And um, that's one, one issue. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if it's a shortfall in the program or if it's a shortfall in um, the way these were designed, or it's just physics, uh, I, I suspect. Um, well, no, I'm not going to make a suspicion. Now, I am just going to say one thing in closing. Ken was very helpful in answering my questions. And then um, I expressed some dissatisfaction with the fact that the program didn't have previews. In fact, I said it was um, it was very serious. And Ken's response to me was, the next few months will be crucial for me to decide if I will keep making poser scripts or just leave like the others have already done. If you would like to burn me up in your video review, it will just make it easier for me to make the decision sooner. After all, I'm the only one left who wanted to do this. When Python skills are very well paid elsewhere, I do it because I love poser, but if people won't support me, I have no reason to stay. Now. I don't know whether or not it's fair to bring that up, if that has anything to do with the review. But when I mentioned negative stuff, he played the sympathy card. In fact, he tried emotional blackmail. And I really don't appreciate that, Ken. You were helpful, and I was trying to be professional by speaking to you. And this response just stinks of, of uh, will be nice to me or I'll quit. And let me just point out, Ken has 30 scripts and dozens more programs on the Poser store. He's, he's about the only one who's making scripts, that's true. But he's making a good amount of money off those scripts and, uh, and even, you know, a, a good amount of money from all of his other products as well. I've got, if you look here, seven scripts by Ken, you know, uh, and... A few bad words in one review of one of them would be enough to make him quit. The ultimate question is, should you buy HDRI control? Given that Easy Dome no longer works with, uh, with Poser 13, and given that Bondware's HDRI setup is awful, it's it really, you know, I mean, it's good that they got something, but barely better than nothing. Um, 
there's a desperate need for this. It's not perfect. It could have been designed better, and I give him full uh, credit for the things that are down to Bond, which, to be honest, is most of most of the issues with this. But in spite of that, this serves a need. I will definitely use it. I, I bought it primarily for my personal use. Uh, it's about twenty dollars, and um, and I will definitely be using it in in future. Uh, I am concerned about the way that it reacts when it's in a scene like this. I, I, I don't, just don't know what that means, you know. Um, but I don't recall Easy Dome doing the same thing when it was ambient light. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, as Ken says, there are a lot of issues with Sky Domes and Easy Dome in particular. Um, is this, a, is this a, a script you should buy? I would say... Uh, it's a great way of creating all-around lighting. Um, uh, to be honest, I, I would like this this bit in in actual scenes to work better. And um, there are other things that I would like to work better, but this is still by a light year uh, the best solution in my opinion for getting HDRs into into poser so should you buy a, yes anyone who is experienced enough to want better lighting probably should but it's not an effortless solution but um i think this is a reasonably priced program and the fact that it loads any hdri without messing about with conversions which um uh, easy dome was more problematic in using uh hdris they were harder to set up more time consuming um I think this is a superior solution. When I asked him about some bugs in the program, um, Ken said to me, well, it's only first version. Um, as if that means, well, yeah, give me time to fix it. And um, Poser uses that all the time, especially with their stupid agile development. And uh, what that means is that they sell you something that's that's a beta and you, you pay full program price and uh, I, I really don't go with that excuse i think the program should be fully fully bug tested and fully working when he releases it and um you know he's selling you a program today on the promise of a fix tomorrow i all i would say is um if it does what you want today and you think that's value then buy it and i i think it mostly does uh but don't expect it to get better tomorrow because you've only got his word for it that it will do. Uh, also, I have to, just in, in closing, I have to say that Ken is really doing the work that Bondware should be doing. His store in uh, in uh, Renderosity or Poser Software is very comprehensive and he's adding a lot of functionality that Bondware should, should have added. Um, Poser is probably 25% better program because of his scripts than it would be without them. Uh, that's an undeniable fact. He is an asset to the community and I, and I give him full, full kudos for that. And um, it would be a massive shame if he left. His, his software uh, certainly makes our lives a lot easier. I'm going to be reviewing some more of it uh, in the near future. You take care.